The Ogden School Foundation recently hosted writer Anthony Horowitz for their fall author event. PBS Utah had a chance to sit down with the best-selling author to ask him about his books, his work for TV, and about Moonflower Murders that he's adapting for PBS. All right, well, thanks for being with us. It's a real pleasure. Thanks for having me. We are delighted. So to start things off, I want to know, when you first got the idea for Magpie Murders, how did it begin? What, what was the idea, and what, when did you know you actually had a story there? Gosh, it's such a difficult question to answer because I could talk for an hour to explain where it all came from. But the first impetus was the idea which came from uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle disliking Sherlock Holmes. As I'm sure you know, but he thought Sherlock Holmes was beneath him, which is why he pushed him off the rack and back falls. And so my first thought was, that why don't I write a story about a writer, a modern writer, who has created a successful detective, but feels that it belittles him, but he hates his detective and wants to sort of get rid of him. So that was the core of the idea. But I was also at that time very interested in writing about murder mystery itself. I've always had a fascination, because I've written so much, and this is very much what I'm going to be talking about tonight. I've always had a fascination with why we read murder stories and why I write them. Uh, and so I wanted to write something that would allow me to both write a murder mystery story and at the same time examine the mechanics of it mm -hmm. and look at what's happening and why we're reading it. So writing about a writer who has written a murder mystery which doesn't have an ending was sort of an elaborate puzzle box that could allow me to disentangle the entire nature of, of this sort of writing and examine what's going on. And I have to say that the book itself, it took me about 15 months to write, which is much, much longer than I normally take. But it took me more than 10 years to think up and to structure and to get right. And the proof of this is that if you watch an early episode of Midsummer Murders, a show I was writing in Britain for ITV, one of the characters, 10 or even 15 years before the book appears in the shops, is already reading a copy of it, because I had it made up, <laughs> and it was there in the TV series, this book I was working on even then. Holy cow. That's right. That's amazing. So speaking of Midsummer Murders, you, you took your own book, uh, Magpie Murders, you adapted it for television. This is your work that you adapted, but you also adapted Caroline Graham's books for Midsummer's Murder. Tell me about your different approaches. Um, I think they were probably quite similar, actually, because the first thing you have to do when you're adapting a book, particularly one as complicated as uh, Magpie Murders, which runs to, I think, about, is it 600 pages and a lot of characters, a lot of twists and turns, but also one of Caroline's books, which are, are themselves very cleverly worked out and, and structured. The first thing you have to recognize is you can't put it all on the screen, and that audiences won't accept amount, that amount of detail and those characters and these twists and these turns. Unlike a book, when you're watching television, you can't stop and go back 50 pages and work out who that character is. So you have to understand that the process of adapting is one of desecration to a certain extent. You have a book which you may consider to be perfect, particularly if you've written it yourself, but you have to say, no, I've got to cut it about, now I want to do this, that, and the other, to turn it into a workable television. So it is an act of dismantling, though one done with great respect. I wouldn't have adapted the Caroline Graham books if I hadn't loved them. I think they are brilliant. They were called Agatha Christie on Acid, which is a great description of what they are. And I loved writing those first seven episodes uh, in really creating that series. Um, but the process was more or less the same. Magpie Murders, the television version, has huge differences to the, to the book. Um, and, and the author of the book might well complain if it wasn't me. Uh, so I was actually happy on both fronts. Are you more inclined to desecrate your works or someone else's? Well, desecrate, I said that, but it's not entirely true what it is what it's reading, because you're hoping to create something that is as good in a different way. All I'm trying to say is, and I use that word simply to say, you can't put something, you know, on, a, on an ivory tower. You can't say, this is perfect, I can't change it. You know, when I adapted Stormbreaker, my own novel, which I didn't do entirely successfully, to be honest with you, um, even there, I was saying, seeing things I loved in the book, but which, for one reason or another, I could not put into the, into the feature film and they just had to go, and you just sort of lose those babies, and it sort of, it hurts in a way, but, but it has to be done. How do you feel about the term cozy mysteries? We call it cozy crime, and it's funny you should ask me that, because it is one of my little bet noir. It's not a phrase I 
ever use. Because I always say that even in the context of an entertainment or an Agatha Christie novel or a, you know, a, a TV drama, whatever it might be, murder is never cozy. The, 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 the taking somebody's life is, is, is the ultimate in violence and horror. It is the worst thing we can do, which is why the prison sentences for it, you know, which used to be a capital punishment in this country, they still are, um, you know, are, are so extreme. Um, so I don't ever call it cozy crime. And that phrase, which is used over and over again, slightly annoys me, it irritates me, because I don't want my books to be thought of that way. I mean, I don't, I know, but they're not violent. And I, I like the fact that there are, that there is a genre of books that does not glorify in violence, that does not have women being attacked in a horrible ways, or children, or I mean, there isn't a sort of an extre extreme quantity of blood and all that sort of stuff. That doesn't interest me any of that. But I wouldn't like to think that the, my characters are all cozy and soft and insipid and, and not worthy of a little bit of hard examination. It is a strange term. Well, I'm glad you asked. Yeah. I've, I've long thought the same thing. We cozy up with this tale of someone killing someone else. That's right. And, and killing is never cozy. Right. Is there in any way that those terminologies are useful when you're thinking about writing a book, though? Do you think in terms of a detective thriller or cozy crime or something like that when you're sitting down to write? No, I don't. I, the, the, the phrase I would use more often is golden age. I'm very drawn to the golden age of detective fiction. Not that I find all those books completely um, uh, enjoyable anymore. I mean, some of them are a little bit slow and some of them are a little bit pompous even. You know, a lot of them were written by quite sort of academic types. But, um, but I do like that world of sort of that, that, that slightly nostalgic world in which forensics and mobile phones and computers have no part to play, where it is all done in the, uh, cerebrally rather than uh, cerebrally, is that the correct word? Uh, in, in your mind. I love Sherlock Holmes for that reason, that he only uses, you know, his, his ability to observe and to analyse and to come to the correct solution, you know, when, when everything that you've considered is impossible, what is left must be the truth, that sort of thing. Um, so that was a terrible misquote, but you know what I mean. Um, so I like that sort of, I like the separation between then and now. And when I'm writing Magpie Murders and Moonflower Murders, the sequel, it's rather fun that I get both uh, and in, uh, on the TV series, both at the same time. And I really enjoy doing the crossover between the two worlds. You mentioned Sherlock Holmes, I have to ask. You wrote, a very well-received Sherlock Holmes pastiche, House of Silk. This is for my own self. Uh, and then you wrote Moriarty. That was in 2014. So it is now 2023. Where's that sequel? Um, a third one. Well, there is a sort of an odd project of mine coming out later this year, which I sort of co-wrote. And um, I'm not entirely sure what people are going to make of it. It's a Sherlock Holmes story, but it's set in the sort of near future. Um, so, so it's it's the modern age. Uh, indeed, it's 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 edging towards science fiction, um, and it's it's playing with Sherlock Holmes in a in a in a rather sort of sacrilegious way. I say that because I am such a worshipper of of Doyle and his work. But nonetheless, it was brought to me by a company, and at the time, I it was COVID was happening, and I I had a lot of time on my hands, so I thought it might be fun. I'll be interested to see what people make of it. Hmm. And that's. For television, or that's no. It's actually an audio book. It's it's not going to be published, as far as I know. It's going to be you you listen to it. This is a company called Storytel, which I think is a Norwegian company, uh, and they are huge in the world of, of audio. And I I have a, a you know a great fondness for audio books. Not personally for myself. I I prefer to read than to have someone read to me. But I know that they are an enormous comfort to people. And of course, on long journeys, it's nothing better. Yeah, exactly. So getting back to this mystery genre that you have found, carved out such a niche for yourself, um, you know, you have, you've written thrillers very successfully, you've written mysteries, you've written adventure books, but I wonder why you continue to return to mysteries at this point. Well, two things have happened. The first is mainly that I've given up writing children's books largely, or YA, young, young adult fiction. That's partly because of my age, uh, and also a, a feeling that, that the world of, of why a fiction is in a bad place at the moment. I'm not sure that I can contribute to it. Um, so, so that's the first thing that's happened. But the second thing that's happened is, is that, the, that my adult writing has taken off. I mean, I didn't expect it to when I started with The House of Silk was one of my very first adult novels, and it was such a success. And this has led me into a sort of a, a new career almost. And I'm 
having a blast. I'm enjoying it. I mean, you know, the, I, I so love the world of murder mystery. I love the other writers that I get to meet uh, here in America and, and, and back home as well. I love the fraternity and sorority that we are of, of writers and, and, and the way we support each other. And I love the sort of the, the fact that, that, that crime stories have had such a huge impact on people. It's an interesting fact that during COVID, and I'm speaking here about the United Kingdom, um, there was a 5% spike in uh, books sold because, of course, people had less to do and were at home. But what I think was really interesting was that it was crime fiction that spiked the most. That's what people wanted to read. And I always think it's interesting, and this is, again, something I'm going to talk about tonight, the way that um, we find such comfort and such uh, a sense of healing and wholeness in crime fiction. It's one of the sort of strange things of life that violent stories about death and, 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 and ugly actions can have this very cathartic effect on people. It's true, but I think also, in addition to that, as you say, there's the puzzle. It well, keeps our mind active. It gives us something to think about. There's a lot to unpick in the question you asked me, because, of course, I've always loved puzzles. I love beguiling people. When I was younger, I loved magic and magic tricks. Moriarty, one of the novels I wrote, my second Sherlock Holmes book, is actually based on a card trick. The entire book works on a simple card trick that I learned at school. Uh, and I love illusion. If you come to my house in London, you will see magic tricks, toys, illusions. We have a secret passage in the house. So everything in my life is devoted to to, 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 to puzzlement and to bafflement and to, uh, and to tantalizing and even to cheating an audience. I, def I always do play fair, but Moriarty, for example, one of my favorite books, plays a tr terrible, terrible trick on the reader. And, and uh, the reason for it was that I was writing about the most evil man in the world, so I thought, let's write the most evil book. And the idea was you get to the last page and look at it and say, what have I just read? And hurl the book across the I room. Think I did which that. some people, <laughs> I met somebody the other day who said they were listening to it on audio, you were talking about audio, and they said they nearly crashed the car when they got to the twist. I said I was delighted. I thought, it, I, I almost wish they had crashed the car, it would make an even better story. Nobody being hurt, of course. <laughs> I remember feeling quite outraged. Well, outrageous, but that said, the book plays 100% fair with you. There is not a single thing in that book that is um, a cheat or a lie. So you're adapting Moonflower Murders for PBS. I have PBS. adapted it. The work is done. We it's are filming. Done. No, 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 it is pretty much done. We have been filming for, oh, goodness knows, I must be about 10, 12 weeks in Ireland. Okay. Uh, and we go to Crete next week. And I go myself physically to Crete for two weeks shooting out there because in the new story, Moonflower Murders, as you know in the book, it opens in Crete where Susan is running a hotel right. with her long-term partner, Andreas. And so we're shooting the opening of a series in Crete, in October, and I'm going there with my wife and, and such, and I'm, even in this hotel this afternoon, mm -hmm. I've been watching the dailies from the okay. shoot in Ireland. And I have to say that we are so fortunate in that, first of all, we managed to reassemble our absolutely wonderful cast, mm -hmm. headed by Leslie and Tim, but also with Condith Hill and Matthew Beard and, and many of the others, and, and the wonderful Danny Mays as Chubb and Locke. So we've got our family back together again. Uh, Peter Catania did an absolutely fantastic job directing the first season, couldn't uh, make it to the second, but we then uh, were very fortunate in that a, 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 a director called Rebecca Gatwood has stepped in and has done a sensational job. I was sitting in my hotel room this afternoon looking at the entire assemblies of week 10 and just thinking, wow, did I really write this? How did it get to be so good? That's what a good director brings to a script. They make it better. It's been a lovely relationship incidentally with PBS. It's been very successful here in the States and I'm happy to say also originally it was trapped in a, in a, in a, in a rather small um, a streamer called Britbox, but it's now been released and so the BBC showed it last uh, spring, which was great, and they're going to show the next one hopefully next spring. And I can't wait for you to see it. I'm so excited. Well, we are excited to see it. As my last question, I have wondered, I've wondered about this for a while. As someone who takes books, adapts them, writes your own books, adapts those, if you could adapt any book that you wanted for television, what would it be? Well, I'd love to do a classic. I mean, I'd like to do uh, New Grub Street by George Gissing. I was talking about just 10 minutes ago um, with, with, in another interview. It's one of my very favorite books. Something from the 19th century to do it, to, to do it. not Dickens. I think Dickens has perhaps been overdone, but, but maybe a Trollope or something of that sort. Um, uh, or else, 
I don't know. I mean, something epic, something big, uh, a Don Quixote type book, Mayor Cervantes, something, something that's a really major piece of writing. I always like to adapt a book, I think, by a writer who is better than me. So that is, that is why, you know, so working on something like a Doyle or a, an Ian Fleming or any of those sorts of things, that's, that to me inspires me. So, so a, a, a big classic, a big epic, something that everybody knows. We will watch for your Trollope adaptation to come. Thank you. Thank you so much.